joining us for today's version of the Bespoke Art and Craftsmanship Summit video. And today we have Jamie from The Memorable Image. What she does is she takes animals and makes cute little sceneries that involve them in different poses. She gives them backstories and she puts really witty sayings on them. These greeting cards will be sure to make you smile and laugh and are perfect for somebody who needs their day brightened. As a reminder, if you've also been following us, we are seeking donations to help offset the cost of this production. Everything that you have seen has been donated by the artists themselves, including all the production costs. So if you've enjoyed what you've watched, please consider paying it forward and giving it back to this group. But not only will you be giving back to this group, you'd be paying it forward to other artisans because a portion of those donations are going to be gifted to CNY Arts as part of their Restart the Arts campaign. And what that does is it really helps those artisans who really struggled during COVID and maybe had to shut their doors or maybe had to change paths, but also help raise up this group that brought this production to you today. Maybe you're watching and you got a question like, how does she set up the different animals in different positions? If you have any questions about a certain video or a certain artist or just in general about the art scene, definitely drop us an email at info at bespokeartcraft.com. We're going live October 23rd, Saturday night, Saturday Night Live, to answer those questions. So if you have some burning art questions that you just want to get asked, definitely ask them. We'll answer them live on Zoom, 7 o'clock, Saturday night, October 23rd. There's something about stories for adults and things that have like a subtle witty humor that gives you kind of like the second laugh or a little bit of snarky dark humor. And I think, you know, we kind of are living all this big shared universal experience where everyone's lives are different, but we all have these like touch points and these lessons that we learn in different ways. And I think that's what really connects the animal tales to people is that they, they see themselves and they love like the absurdity of what's going on with the animals. The Animal Tales started out as a bit of a personal challenge and a bit of an accident. I was in like a home and garden store trying to fulfill this dream of having a garden. I kill all the green things. And as I was wandering around, there was this bin of animals and they had come a really, really long way. This is Pansy. She's actually one of my first animals. And I picked up like this panda, a fox, two rabbits and a sheep or something. And I was really impressed with how realistic they were and the expressions on their faces. And I noticed that in the bin, all the animals had slightly different expressions. They're all hand painted, so the eyes are all a little bit different. And I kind of went through the bins and picked up the ones that had the best looking expressions to me. And I brought them home and I started using them as kind of like little setup or lighting challenges. I would put them places and I would photograph them in that light and I just amused myself. I was coming up with stories about what was going on in the background and those stories were very reflective of what was going on in my life at the time. Um, like this one with Pansy is, she's kind of a bit horrified at these curtains. Um, and it, she's photographed like on a windowsill with these lacy curtains. And it was very much what was going on in my life at the time. I had ordered these curtains off eBay or something and I thought they were one pattern and they came and they were this much frillier pattern than I had imagined and I was kind of like ooh, and she kind of had the expression that summed that up so that's how the animal tales started and I was doing them kind of just for fun when I'm coming up with tales sometimes I have an idea of what I want the end photo to look like which would in this case we'll be using Tony and this is just a rough sketch that lets me know the basic composition and this little guy right here is Tony and so I'm going to start setting up by this and I have an idea of like what the lesson's going to be and what the copy or the story is going to be. But it's going to take like after I shoot it will continue to evolve. 
So this is where I start. This is toning in all the words in the world and the tale is about having all the words in the world at your disposal and not being able to find the right ones to say for different situations. So it'll be Tony. I've got a bunch of legal pads and crumpled paper because he keeps on trying to write this letter and he can't. I've got a bunch of empty pens. He runs out of ink before he can find the right words. It took me a long time to get to this tale because I had to use all the pens up. And then I've got my basic floor, my backdrop, and then the foam core that I use to create walls, essentially. This is my studio. Almost everything shot on this drafting table. This is just a base. This drafting table, it does have the ability to go up and down, um, which is great because I can change the height in relation to the windows. This big window here is my main light source. In my current studio, I only use natural light. In my last studio, which was the attic of a Victorian house, I only used studio lights, so off-camera lighting. And with the animals, I, it's really important for me to keep their faces well lit, particularly their eyes. I don't do really any Photoshop work on them. It's all done in camera, meaning I shoot it as it is. The only thing I really do in Photoshop or Lightroom is I will adjust the brightness and the contrast and crop them down and then touch out any hairs that happen to get into the picture because I have three dogs, so inevitably he will get a little white wispy hair stuck to his head at some point during the shoot. But everything else is done in camera, so their expressions, how they're posed, how their eyes look, all that stuff I have to manage on this end. When we first moved to upstate New York, I knew I was gonna go into business for myself. Um, I had been doing photography. My training was in photography, but I had worked in advertising and design for a long time, managing projects and design teams, and I thought that I would be doing very traditional photography. I thought I would be doing like weddings and portraits and some fine art stuff because that's like when you go to school that's what you're really prepped for and those are the tracks that you know are out there. So I chose the memorable image and it was available and that was a big shock at the time that it hadn't been taken. So that's where the name came from. It's very much I believe that Every story can be summed up in an image, and I believe every you know image has a story behind it. To start with is the floor. Tony out of the way. Okay. So I've got that. I've got Tony set up. He's going to be in the center for all intents and purposes at this point. And at this point, I'm actually going to bring my camera into the mix so I can start framing things in my camera. So as I build. I'm building for my view. So this is my main camera now. This is a Fuji X-T10. It's a mirrorless camera. The main difference, when I started the Animal Tales, I was shooting on a Nikon. I've been shooting on Nikon since I was in high school. My parents gave me one as a graduation gift. Your camera kits as you grow and build them, it's just kind of like a marriage. You're sort of with who you're with forever. But when we moved up here, my studio was much smaller. Everything was smaller. I wanted a lighter camera and I wanted one I could carry around in my bag so I could do a lot of other photography. The Nikon that I had was quite large um, and quite heavy. So this is what I settled on. I do love the Fuji cameras. This one's mirrorless. And what that means is it's not like a through the lens. Everything's, it doesn't really matter anymore anyway because this is all done through the LCD. on this, through the screen on the back. But the Nikons and like traditional cameras with through the lens, well, how that works is there's a mirror in there that reflects like what's coming through the lens up into the viewfinder. And that mirror actually takes up, it's, it's not huge, but it makes the camera bodies bigger. Um, and once you eliminate that, you get these super streamlined bodies. So now that I've got the floor set up, I'm essentially building a room. What I need to do is I need to create a backdrop I always use two very large pieces of foam core. So what's happening here is that the foam core in the back serves two purposes. It gives me a back wall and then it also allow, which allows me to hang the wallpaper or the background off of but it's blocking the light from that rear window. I don't want the animal tails backlit. It makes it really hard to see the details on their faces. So that's purpose is, is as a flag, as well as something to hang things on. I have this bag of, it's essentially pre-crinkled paper that I'm gonna be using to kind of build the set behind them. So this is all the paper that he tried to write on and it just didn't 
he didn't like how it turned out. So he's got a bunch of crinkled paper, and if you remember from my sketch, it's high on this side, it's gonna come down behind him like this. I was the kid who stole my family's Polaroid when I was like five, in like the very early 80s, and just loved loved the magic of it, and then, you know, when I was like 10, I stole my dad's film camera to take pictures, and I would, I really had no idea what I was doing, but I would find these little, like, vignettes of, like, little flowers like this, and I was always, always telling stories my family, particularly my father was huge on um, storytelling. My mom was big on, like, early literacy, so reading, so... I would just take these pictures and make up stories about them and then make my dad like go get the film developed and it'd be all out of focus because I, I've always loved photographing still lifes really close but I didn't understand there's something called a minimum focal distance like you can't like get up on top of a rose and do macro photography with your average lens I mean I was like 10 I didn't understand any of this um now I now I do so went through kind of that phase just doing photography like around when I get film and stuff for Christmas and then in high school I signed up for a black and white class at a school I, I'm from Vermont so very small towns at another um school that was an after school class and I just remember my first time in the dark room and watching this sheet of paper go into the developer and this image coming up and I to this day I can absolutely feel that same feeling. It was magic watching this image come up and I was just, and I understand like it's science, but it feels like magic and I was like, <gasps> and I was just hooked and you know went through you know that class, kept on photographing when I graduated high school. My parents gave me my own film camera <laughs> for my graduation. It was a, a Nikon and it had a automatic rewind. It was very tech back then. That was in the um, mid 90s and I, there wasn't anything else I wanted to do but photography. So kind of ripped up scraps of paper around him as well. I wanted to be holding a legal pad or using a legal pad, so I've got like a mini a mini one for him, and I can try and set it up so that it kind of rests in his fingers like this, but I think it's just going to be too big. And I could prop that up, but looking in the camera, it's actually blocking a lot of his body, which makes him hard to read. It's blocking pretty much his lower half, so you can't see his tail and stuff. So I'm going to want to make an adjustment for that. I still want the legal pad, but I need to find a way to essentially have it propped up in front of him so he can be writing on it. And that, for that, I've got this right here. This is just a little magnetic easel. And then, so I've got things framed up. I want him to be holding a pen. He's got all these empty pens that he's gone through. So I'm going to put it on the pen. And then it's not going directly in his hand. It's actually come here, little buddy. Going to go on his wrist. So I don't have a super tech way of attaching anything that you're building you want to be able to take down quickly and damage as little of the paper of the foam core as possible. So what I'm going to do is, I, at this point I'm just going to clip it to the top and then go around and adjust the positions. And if the bottom is rolling a bit, I will just use painter's tape. So I love alliteration. And I very much remember having this teacher being like, alliteration is lazy and horrible. And I was like, you try, I would, you know, write things using as many A words as possible. Like, I just love alliteration. It's got a really good mouthfeel, um, which is something that's hard to explain. But if you ever read books out loud, sometimes you read one and you're like, it just flows and it feels great and it probably has alliteration in it. So for the most part, it's just alliteration. They're not named after people or anybody I know. It's not like that, but like, the T-Rexes are Tonya, and there's Tanya and Timmy, Pansy the Panda, um, I just, the first, I look at them, the first name that comes to me, Betsy the Bunny, Sammy the Squirrel, there are a couple things that do break the alliteration thing, but for reasons, I have a dog somewhere, it's, um, 
there's a card, like a little Jack Russell Terrier with like a huge dog bone in one of the cards, and the dog's name is Jack. It's not like dog. I do have a dog named Doug who's a dachshund, but you know, it's because it's, it's a Jack Russell. Um, so where it does break, it tends to be simply because the, the actual like breed within has a name. The only one that really is broken off, I've got this little creature, Edwin. Um, nobody knows what Edwin is. When it comes to like picking my animals, I, Edwin is a bit of an outlier in that he's not plastic, he's probably plastic somewhere in there. But he's, he's furry. I don't have a hard and fast rule against these types of things. I just kind of go with whatever speaks to me. Edwin appeared in a Christmas ornament box. No one knows where he came from. I didn't own him. Nobody will own up to putting him there. And as I'm wrapping the Christmas ornaments, it was all like mercury glass and stuff. And then he just like fell out of the box and I thought he was a dead mouse. And then I screamed and I was like, oh God. And then I picked him up and he's, he's very much obviously like a Christmas ornament of sorts. Um, but nobody knows where he came from. And he was all wrapped up like a precious little heirloom, so he's just kind of come to stay. He's the newest member, I'd say. And he looks really, really grumpy. Like, super grumps. And I don't know what he is. His tail would lead me to believe he's a raccoon, but he doesn't have a mask. He just has, like, way too much smudgy eyeliner going on. And he's got long hair like a Persian cat. So this is, this is Edwin. And his name came about because I have like a couple ways calling him like Creeper McJeepers or Grumple Stilt Skin or Edwin. And I put out in my newsletter, I was like, just let, let's, you know, pick a name or if you have any suggestions. And some people sent in suggestions. There was River, there was Gus, there were some really good ones. But a lot of people voted. Edwin was like, by far, they're like, that's an Edwin. It's a distinguished name. And, you know, all these animals have backstories. So like, I know I've already started to build like a little personality and character around this guy that will affect the, what he does in Tales later. Like he's got this little ticket, says keep this coupon, that's always with him. He's, he's really good at rule following, you know what I mean? But he's also like the neighborhood sticky beak. Like he's gonna judge everybody's yard. He's gonna know what's going on. I mean, if he had pants, he'd like wear them like up in his armpits and he's, he loves, you know, sprinkles, hates glitter. Like there's just kind of a lot of different little pieces. He's just like a little grumpy old man animal. And I love him. We, we have managed to build a full set and a full world out of nothing but a dinosaur, some empty pens, a bunch of legal pads, and some paper and foam cord. So this is Tony's world. I am gonna start shooting. It's, I'm gonna take a couple shots um, and then I'll reposition Tony. Okay. So that's the image and let's zoom in and see what we're working with. So you can see the paper's a little bit out of focus. I'm gonna go up. But you can see his eye and his mouth is. His eye is actually starting to fall out of focus. So right now my focal point is right here on his muzzle. You can see how how crisp that is. Let's zoom in more. Um, you can see his eye starts to get a little bit out of focus, so what I need to do is I need to just tweak things, because his eye is the most important thing in this to me, is to have that in focus. I don't want his teeth to be out of focus, but this is where I'm going to get his expression from. So, and a couple other little things. This little guy has got an articulated jaw, so I can tweak that. And then let's just slightly turn Tony, hopefully not taking down my whole stack of paper, because it's resting on him. Okay. And then I'm going to go in. So what I really need to do is I need my focal point to be right on his eye. So I'm actually going to move myself instead of moving him. Okay. This thing's stuck in a bit of a cycle. There we go. Okay. It's just going to be a tiny movement on my part. His eyes in focus, his teeth are in focus. He looks like all the light, everything is pretty perfect. Now he looks very much like he's staring intently at something. And that, he's staring very much at this. He's trying to figure out what to say. It's, this right now is the perfect setup. So it's, probably fairly obvious that I love animals. Um, I grew up with them, have always really appreciated what they add to my life. So I give a portion of the, 
um, my profits to two charities. One is down in the um, southern tier in Binghamton. It's called Every Dog's Dream. They are a 100% volunteer run organization. They are absolutely fabulous. Despite their name, they work with cats. They have a, do a huge thing during kitten season. They do a lot of um, TNR. And then they just, the work they do and the difference they make is huge. Two of my dogs now actually came from there. Um, and I have always just been so impressed with them. And then the other one that I give to up here is called Bernard's Beagle Rescue. We did some fostering through them um, and they bring up a lot of kind of like beagles and the hunting dogs from the south and then also help with um, homing dogs up here. But they take on some like really, really hard luck cases. And again, it's huge volunteer efforts and just the impact that they make is so near and dear to me that I make sure that a portion of my proceeds go to them every year. So the camera wirelessly sends everything to the computer and then I import them into Lightroom. Uh, Lightroom is an Adobe program. It does a lot of kind of the basic photo things. I use Lightroom and Photoshop. Lightroom for like the basic kind of contrast adjustments that need to be done and Photoshop kind of for the final output. I use 5x7 as my base for the animal tails. All the animal tail cards are 5x7 but the actual proportion of the frame in there isn't five by seven thing off. So I'm going to make sure that I've got enough room above that magnetic clip there. At the same time, I don't want the edge of the foam core. Okay. today's presentation with Jamie from The Memorable Image. If you want to support her, go to her website and check it out and sign up for her newsletter. She has some really cute cards while you're there. If you're looking to send and brighten somebody's day, maybe they're in the hospital, maybe they're just not feeling well, consider getting one of her cards and sending it to them because it will really brighten their day and change their mood. And when you're on her website, make sure to sign up for her email address. She frequently sends out newsletters. Definitely sign up, check it out. Again, it's thememorableimage.com where you can see her products as well as sign up for her newsletter. If you're watching us during the week, I encourage you to come back tomorrow. Check out the video CNY Arts. What is CNY Arts? And how do they really help the economy and the local art scene? So definitely come back tomorrow, check us out with CNY Arts. But if you're watching us during the All Play weekend, Go check out all the other videos. We have jewelry, ceramics, um, bicycle repurposing fabrics, and each story from each of these artisans is really unique as to how they got to where they are, how they named their business, what really motivated and inspired them. So again, if you missed any of those videos, go check that out.